everyone, and welcome to the 132nd episode of The Atlas Society Asks. My name is Jennifer Anju Grossman. My friends call me JAG. I'm the CEO of The Atlas Society. We are a nonprofit organization introducing young people to the ideas of Ayn Rand in fun, artistic, creative ways such as our animated videos and graphic novels. Today, we are joined by Andrew Bernstein. But before I even begin to introduce our guest, I want to remind all of you who are watching us on Zoom, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, go ahead, queue up and uh, type your questions into that chat and we will get to as many of them as we can. So our guest today, Andrew Bernstein, holds a PhD in philosophy from the Graduate School of the City University of New York, and he taught philosophy for many years at Marist College. He is a lifelong objectivist who frequently writes for the Objective Standard and speaks at events sponsored by Students for Liberty, the Foundation for Economic Education, and the Institute for Human Studies, among others. Uh, Professor Bernstein is also the author of numerous essays and books, including The Capitalist Manifesto, Objectivism in One Lesson, and his latest book, Why Johnny Still Can't Read or Write or Understand Math and What We Can Do About It. Andy, thank you so much for joining us. It's great being here, Jack. Thanks for having me on. So uh, as mentioned, you are certainly an icon of the objectivist movement. Uh, you have a lot of fans among uh, the, uh, the younger people uh, of all ages here at the Atlas Society. Um, but I'd love to talk about, uh, and I've got to talk about your latest book, but also about your origin story. Where did you grow up and what sparked your interest in philosophy and how did you come to discover Rand's works. Well, an origin story. It's like being a superhero, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I didn't realize I was an icon, Jack. That's heavy pressure to, to live up to. But, uh, um, you know, I was born and raised in, in Brooklyn, New York. People didn't don't realize that. They hear me talk. They think I'm from Louisiana, but they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. But um, I, was, uh, I was very lucky in high school the one thing, the one thing I, I went through the government schools K through 12. Uh, so I can't say that I was lucky overall, but the one yep, thing I was here. lucky. Yeah. Yeah. They're terrible. They were terrible then and they're worse now. But um, I, I had a, a teacher named Jay Hyman. I mentioned his name because he was a great guy. And um, I'm not sure if he's still alive. He'd be in, in his eighties. I hope, I hope he is, but he was a great guy. He was a PE teacher and he had, taught a hygiene class, went through the hygiene curriculum very quickly and then, you know, discussed uh, Ayn Rand and objectivism. And this was, you know, in late 1960s, the war in Vietnam was raging, uh, riots on college campuses. And, you know, and uh, he discussed Ayn Rand's ideas and their application to these topical issues. And it just made so much sense to me. I mean, I was just hooked right away because, I mean, I grew up in a crazy family in a, in a crazy world. And this just absolutely made sense. And I went that summer and I, and I read all of Ayn Rand's novels and I knew right away this was the most important thing in the world. And, uh, you know, and the more I've learned since then, the more that's validated my, it's vindicated my judgment that this is, Ayn Rand's books and ideas are the most important things in the, in the world. So I thank you to Jay Hyman, you know, for, you know, for introducing me. Do you think there was something about uh, being raised in a, in a somewhat dysfunctional or chaotic environment that um, made you all the hungrier to try to find some principles that helped you make sense of the world? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point, Jack, because some people, you know, there's no getting away from volition in, in human life, right? Some people brought up under craziness just become crazy, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, you know, I did to a certain extent. I certainly had, had issues, but, but I was trying to make sense out of it all. I was always on that premise, and I was always very inductive, you know, that I was always observing the facts and then trying to explain, you know, find the principles that would explain the facts. So when I read, and I was always a humanities guy, I was never gonna be a, a scientist. Uh, I was always a, you know, a literature, philosophy, history guy. And so I read Ayn Rand's novels and then the, the novels are just literarily magnificent. I mean, I think 
The Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged are the two greatest novels ever written. You know, I'll stand by that judgment till the day I die. The Fountainhead is my all time favorite book, period. You know, literally, you know, fiction, nonfiction, or, or whatever. But also, of course, as a vehicle to express Einstein's philosophy, especially Atlas Shrugged, uh, yeah, it just makes so much sense to me. It explained uh, history, you know, s- social events, and explained metaphysical reality all in one brilliant comprehensive philosophic packets. I was, I was, I want to say addicted, but I was hooked right away. I mean, yes, this, this explains, this explains so much, right? I knew that I right can away. relate, as I'm sure can many of our viewers. So I want to get to this book. Uh, you are a longtime educator with many Teacher of the Year awards. Uh, well, two, 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 any, two anyway. Uh, from two, two co- and from two colleges, right? Yes. So um, what inspired you to write Why Johnny Still Can't Read or Write? Um, And yeah. Well, you know, I was a few years ago, you know, I've always been a hero worshiper and and I always want to write a book on heroes. And I did publish what what year was that? 2019, maybe. Mm -hmm. And I was doing the research (coughs) a few years ago. Uh, and then if you, you notice the hero book is done very inductively. I start with certain people and pull the principles out of them. Maria Montessori was one. And, you know, I contrasted people who did great things like she did with every day, you know, every, every day, hard work and on, honest people um, and bad guys. And, you know, and, and look for, well, you know, dis, look to distinguish, you know, integrate and differentiate as we learned from the objectivist epistemology. So I was doing the research on Maria Montessori. And you know, Jack, Ayn Rand's theory of epistemology, of, of the spiral theory of knowledge, that knowledge isn't necessarily linear. You know, you learn something, you understand it at a decent level, you go on in your life, you learn more, you come back to that earlier point, you come back at a de- at a, with a deeper awareness of it. I was doing the research on Maria Montessori and it just hit me. And the progressives, mm-hmm. You know, as soon as as soon as she started to become known in the United States, about 1912, the progressive educators, William Herr Kilpatrick, they immediately attacked her. And, and it, it dawned on me at a deeper level. I think something I'd always known, but it just hit me at a deeper level. Jack, they did it on purpose. They, they, they didn't just wreck the educational system. They did it on purpose. They stunted the minds of millions of, of kids. They did it on purpose. And it hit me, yeah, you couldn't mess something up this bad by accident. This has to be done on purpose. And it was. And I realized, wow, wow, this needs, uh, you know, there's a lot of good books on how bad the schools are, but this needs a treatment from, from a distinctively objectivist perspective. And I... Wow. I, I yeah, it's so it's so well written. It's so um, accessible. I mean, and you know, you manage to say it all and and give recommendations. And um, it's uh, it's a relatively uh, quick and easy read. It's not overly academic. Um, but I was really fascinated. I used to be director of education policy at the Cato Institute, and I, and I worked with Andrew Coulson, who you mentioned in, in the book. Ah, I love his book, Market Education. It's terrific. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and his history of, uh, of American education. Most people don't realize that this country was founded on private education, not mm-hmm. government schools. So uh, let's talk a little bit about ways in which the dismal academic performance of today's schools traced back to the progressive education movement in the late 19th century, early 20th century. And um, in what ways, you talk about this in book in the book, did uh, the brewing socialism of that time and even the eugenics movement influence this departure from traditional American education? Yeah, that's a good point, Jack, because prior to right, right around the time of World War One, you know, give or take a few years, American education was superb. You know, even after the they imposed government schooling in the mid 19th century, the, the, the schools were much more responsive to the parents. The parents generally then and now want the kids have this funny idea that kids learn how to read, you know, and, and write effectively and have basic you know, skills in mathematical calculation and, and uh, no history and so on and so forth. So the schools taught academic subjects and the, the kids did well. It was in the early 20th century uh, with the rise, of, like, like you mentioned, the, the, the progressives. And of course, you know, I mentioned in the book, 
if we were going to write a historical novel on this topic, the the, the 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 demise of the American school system, John Dewey would be the would be the novel's villain. You know, world class philosopher. Dewey would be the Tui. Yeah, exactly. Dewey, <laughs> Dewey the Tui. Yeah, I like that. Uh, he was a world class philosopher. Not that I recommend reading Dewey. He's he's. He was influenced by Hegel. He's very difficult to read. But I mean, he had the reputation of being a world-class philosopher. And he, he brought the imprimatur of, you know, of lofty philosophy to the progressive movement. And their main idea, William Hurd Kilpatrick, who, you know, Dewey was a philosophy professor at Columbia University, philosophy department for many years or early, I think 1905 to 1930. William Hurd Kilpatrick, his leading disciple, headed the philosophy of education department at Columbia University Teacher College which was the leading teacher college, you know, at, at that time. And their idea was that um, we don't, the, the, you know, or oh, you mentioned eugenics. Um, you know, we couldn't, in a free country, they, they wanted to sterilize the, the people who were not, the, you know, the, the, the less intelligent people in society. In a free country, you can't do that, right? Uh, so the next best thing was, they use the IQ test, which has just come in in the early 20th century, the Stanford Binet test. You IQ everybody, IQ test all the kids, you know, a very young age. And the best, the best and the brightest, how platonic is this for anybody who knows, you know, the, the theory of the philosopher king in, in the Republic? You know, the best and the brightest get the full academic program. You know, they'll get math and history and literature and science and everything. They're going out to college. They'll be society's future leaders in the classroom and in the legislature. The rest of us, we don't need that much academic training. You know, we need practical skills, you know, like driver's ed, sex ed, hygiene, things like that. And, of course, vocational skills, metal shop, wood shop for the kids in the city who are going to be factory workers, agriculture for the kids in rural areas, going to be farm workers, et cetera. We don't need much uh, in intellectual training. Uh, the, uh, the goal for the, their goal for the overwhelming majority of the population was that one, we should be good at our jobs, and two, we obey the wise rules of the state, the socialist system that they that they want to impose. And not for nothing, as they might say in my native Brooklyn, <laughs> where did Dewey and Kilpatrick and some of these other guys from Columbia University uh, teacher college pilgrimage to in the 1920s to find the kind of educational system they wanted. They went to the Soviet Union, Jack. Soviet, I mean, I can't even say this with a straight face. They, they came back with glowing reports about Soviet education because the Soviets obviously as good communists taught the kids that they can't you know, live egoistically. They can't pursue their own happiness. Everything have to live for the state. The state comes first, foremost, and always. There's the shabby secret, you know, behind progressive education and the, and the, and the reason to dumb down the, the school system. You don't want the kids asking too many questions. You don't want them having too much knowledge. You don't want them, you know, questioning the wise rules of, of the state. Just do your job, obey the state, and everybody lives for the state, and we'll have a beautiful collectivist socialist world. That's the mentality. Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, the imposition of government schooling, as I understand it, was also influenced by uh, the, the Prussian model yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. they wanted to yes. cultivate good factory workers and soldiers. Um, who right. But you go back, to, go back to the 19th century, people like Horace Mann, you know, one of the early advocates of government schooling. You know, people today, the... The leftists today, they, the, their propaganda is they had to impose government schooling because Americans were illiterate, uh, you know, before that. That's just a lie. There's a lot of proxy data shows how, how high the American literacy levels were. And, I, and I, you know, I mentioned a lot of it in, in the book. The one that really gets me, Jack, is that, you know, in the, in the late 18th century, the essays of the Federalist was a really, you know, sophisticated political theorizing. Well, largely, you know, written by Madison, Jay, and Hamilton to, you know, to, uh, to promote the ratification of the Constitution. Those were largely newspaper editorials written for, you know, every man and, and every woman. My, my college students would really struggle with those today. But there's a lot of proxy data showing how high American literacy levels, levels were. But no, the real, the real reason for imposing going in schools, uh, one, what you mentioned, Horace Mann and his ill journey to... Germany. They were appalled by the individualism of American society, the selfishness of it. You know, you, you're rugged individualist, you live for, you know, you're living for your own well-being and your families and everything. They wanted 
the kids to grow up to you know, serve the state. And they went to Germany where the German schools taught exactly that. And they came back, you know, with uh, the German, the Germanic approach to education. That's what they wanted. Government. That was the, one, one of the two main reasons why the government school system was imposed to, to indoctrinate service to the state rather than individualistic life amongst American kids. Yep. So your book starts off with the title, Why Johnny Still Can't Read. By the way, I know we have a lot of Audible fans in the audience uh, and the Audible version of this is excellent. So we're putting those links into all of the chats, but let's talk to specifically why Johnny uh, still can't read and the adoption um, of this look, say, whole word approach and the uh, abandoning of phonics. What was that all about? Well, yeah, you know, people, a lot of people in, in the audience probably recognize my title is a, is a take on Rudolph Flesh. Rudolph Flesh in 1955 published a famous book titled Why Johnny Can't Read. And it was a brilliant defense of phonics against the whole word method that was, you know, that was dominant then. Well, why John Dewey, again, the philosopher of, of, the, of this movement, uh, put in so many words. There's, um, I don't remember the exact quote, I have it in the book, but it's to the effect that, you know, there's, there's no social gain in kids learning to read early or gaining knowledge, this you know that 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 kind of uh, individualistic activity where you you, know, you, sit, you sit by yourself and read a book and you and you read it well and you learn from it very naturally and easily passes into selfishness. Do we do we say you know you want the kids working in groups, you want them to learn to cooperate and to conform you know to the to the consensus of, of the group. So um, the the progressives were uh, you know you know it reminds me of Jack. Um, the great Chinese philosopher Confucius said a long time ago that the beginning of wisdom lies in calling things by their right names. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I never call leftist liberals. They're not supporters of liberty. I'm a liberal. They're not progressives. Socialism is regressive. It's not, it doesn't, doesn't promote progress. But, you know, but anyhow, the, the, these, guys, these guys want, these, you know, they're, they're leftists. They're socialists. Uh, they want they want people to serve the state and they, they don't want kids reading well at an early age. It's it's just it, it, it makes a kid much more independent. He can think for himself or herself, not inclined to conform to the group or obey the wise rulers of the state. So they they used the word method, not because they thought it was a better method to teach reading, but because they knew it was worse. This is just makes your hair stand up. And they crippled. They, they deliberately crippled the ability of millions and millions and millions of American kids uh, in, in, in the, you know, their, their ability in the most important cognitive skill of all in reading. They did it on purpose. They're not just yes. wrong. They're evil. Let's talk about uh, social studies. I didn't realize till I read your book that this was done to replace history and, and other uh, studies. How did that come about? Yeah, it's more than 100 years ago. It was, it was around 1918. It was right around the end of, of World War I. They did away with history uh, and, and replaced it with social studies, which is a mongrel hybrid of, you know, of topics that sometimes include some history, but not very much. You know, and, and, and oh, my poor, I'll give you an example. I mentioned it in the book. My, you know, poor kids, I won't mention any, any names here, but I had a, this is a logic class. This is right before the pandemic shut us down. So it would have been two and a half, three years ago. Um, 20, the arithmetic here is simple. The 20 kids in a college level logic class. And, you know, logic is really abstract. So I try to give a lot of instances, you know, in, in observable reality to tie, you know, to tie it to, to facts. So I was, I, had, I don't remember the context anymore, Chegg, but, um, I wanted to mention James Madison. I think that's pretty safe. People, people, American kids must know James Madison. Well, it turns out it wasn't so safe. 10, 10 or 20 American college kids, born, reared, schooled here, never heard of him. They never heard of James Madison. Uh, 10 out of 20 heard of him. They knew, they knew he'd been POTUS. They'd, be, they'd been president of the United States. But not one in 20, not one in 20 knew that he was the lead author of the U.S. Constitution and virtually the sole author of the Bill of Rights. Not one. They don't 
teach much history. They teach much less history than they should. And social studies is this, you know, this mongrel grab bag that could mean different things in different school districts to different principals to different teachers and, and often does. So in social studies today, a lot of times they don't teach history, but they'll teach how man-made warming is destroying the planet or how uh, white people are all racist and, and uh, you, yeah. and, and you know, uh, an America is still systemically racist country, like like it was during Jim Crow era. Any, anything goes in the, in the social studies classes, and there's very little history taught anymore. So, uh, to what extent is teacher training part of the problem? How how are these teachers being trained? Oh uh, or... yeah, that's a, that's a good question. That's can I can I start by telling a story? I told it in Please? the book. And, so the year was uh, 1999, 2000, right, on, right around this time of year. And um, Cliff's Notes got in touch with me to, to write, you know, the study guides for, every, I imagine everybody knows what Cliff's Notes are, you know, study guides for great works of literature. And they wanted, they wanted to hire me to write the study guides for three Ayn Rand titles, for Anthem, The Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugs. I said, sure, yeah, great, let's do it. Uh, and the, the chief editor of Cliff's Notes, I still remember his name, he's a really, very honest guy. He said to me, when Cliff's notes, Cliff's notes first started out, 1950s, 1960s, their, dem their main demographic was high school and college kids. Mm -hmm. Some were too lazy to read the book, you know, and some someone Cliff's notes helped them understand the book because Cliff's notes are usually pretty good. The thing I always liked about Cliff's notes is they're very grounded in the story. They don't float away just dealing with you know interpretations of symbols and stuff. They focus on the story and, and then place the interpretations of, you know, in, in the facts of the story. So it's very observation oriented, very, it's very rational. Uh, and so he said, but then he said, but by 1999, 2000, a lot had changed. He said, now our main demographic is high school English teachers who, wow. either, who, who either have never read the books they're assigned to teach or worse, they don't understand that. So they need, they, the, the, the English teachers need to read the Cliff's Notes. And the reason for that is, you know, as I discussed in the book, to, to be a high school teacher, in, I think in, in, in all of the 50 states today, you need to, your, your, your college training needs to focus in the field of education. So you're taking many education courses, which in my judgment, you know, fortunately, I never had to take any, but I see from the outside, look at the curriculum, the syllabus and everything. For the most part, I think they're worthless. Uh, and um, so they're taking a lot of education courses, which means the, f the future math teachers are taking fewer math courses than, say, just a go on a variety math major, major in college because he or she has to take all these education courses and similarly for the literature teachers and history teachers and so on so the to be brutally honest they don't know much uh content they don't they haven't been trained in content they've been trained more in method uh, so that's that's the reason why why so many teachers simply don't know enough to teach high school classes and english teachers don't know enough literature to, to teach jane Eyre, let's say or you know uh, uh, tale of two cities without reading the you know the cliff notes so I, I i said in the book jack teacher training should be easy first of all train the future teachers in content the math teachers should be taking math classes not education classes and so on and if the if those if those students those college graduates now really know their subject whether it's literature or science or you know or history or math whatever it is i could teach them I'm a pretty good teacher. I could teach them how to teach in one course. What well, does it take four years? I could teach them, you know, in, in, in one course, if they know their subject, if they know the content, I could give them a whole bunch of tips on how to communicate, especially give examples, induce, tell stories. You'll pull the principles right out of the stories and the examples, tie it to reality. Be enthusiastic. Yell if you have to. Not if not in anger, but just to you know to modulate your voice. Walk around the room. Don't sit on the desk. There's a whole bunch of things. But above all, tell stories. Give examples. Pull the principles out of the examples and the stories. Tie it to reality. These are the these are the hallmarks of a good communicator. So, so but you got to know the subject to start with. So one of the things I thought was most interesting about your book uh, is that. Even let's say if you're not interested in how we got here or the history uh, and you're just a parent or a grandparent or you're thinking about having a family someday and you 
don't want to subject your children to uh, to government schools because um, you see what the results are, you can find there are a lot of practical uh, suggestions that you that you uh, have in here, and in part because you talk about uh, this interlocking directorate of, of unions and um, bureaucrats and teacher training schools, and and that in some ways it's kind of an in, penetrable fortress, right? But you say it, we might not be able to overcome it, maybe not now, but but there is a way to outflank it. And you give all of these different uh, examples of, of homeschooling, which a lot of people find intimidating, or hybrid schools, micro schools, tutors. So if we could just get into to some of those, those suggestions and solutions that you offer in the book. But buy the book, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, there's a lot of things parents can do uh, to help their kids. A lot of parents, you're right, intimidated by it. They say, they say we're, we're not teachers. You know, we don't have the training to be teachers. And well, we work hard all day. We're tired by the time we get home from work, which, you know, is, un is understandable. One of, one of my responses, uh, you're right up front, is how good a teacher do you have to be to do a better job than the government schools uh, uh, are doing? And the answer to that is not, you don't have to be, you don't have to be very good. But, but, but anyhow, uh, yeah, there's a lot of options. First of all, the single, I point out, the single most important cognitive skill is reading. And it's easy to learn how to read. You know, anybody who's not brain damaged can, can learn how to read easily. So what I recommend, I you know, did with my, my daughter when she was like two, so, you know, we, we go out to the park to play and, and everything, do all kinds of fun things. And part of the fun things we would do is we would go to the library or the bookstore and, and, and she'd pick out a book. It's important for the child to pick out the book because you want something that appeals to him or her. <laughs> Anybody who knows my daughter, Penny, she's always, she's 19 now. She's always been a very, very careful shopper. So we stand in, in Barnes and Noble and, and it takes an hour for her you know, to pick out the book she wants. But all right. It's got to be, it's got to be the one she wants. She sits down on the floor, past the floor next to her. You know, she says, sit down, daddy, and read to me. So I would, you know, and it was usually some goofy story about dogs that could fly or kittens who thought the full moon was a bowl of milk. But that's not the point. The point is you want the child to, re to realize the books are fun. And once the, once the kid realizes books are fun, then she's motivated or he, you know, is motivated. And by the time you get to four or five, you don't have to wait till the kid's six years old. Using systematic phonics, teaching the kids the, the, the letters of the alphabet, the sounds the letters make, the sounds, the combinations of letters make, you can teach a motivated child to read in a matter of weeks. Weeks. It's easy. It's as easy as riding a bike. It's not this tortuous process, you know, the schools have made into. Most important, the kids now know books are fun and they're motivated to read and they're on their way to be lifelong readers. And the whole world of knowledge is open to them at that point. That's the single most important thing. And any parent could do that. Uh, so I, I, mean, I, want, I, want to, I want to emphasize that. Uh, but also homeschooling. Yeah, I mean, the homeschoolers, there's a lot of people since the pandemic, especially have been moving towards homeschooling. I was glad my buddy Brad Thompson down at Clemson pointed out to me Really good news. The leading demographic of people moving to homeschooling are Black Americans who've had it with the schools, you know, with the, with the government schools, and that's great. You know, that's great to see. And homeschool kids generally, you know, test pretty much the same as private school kids, so much better than the kids in the in the government schools. So a lot of people move to homeschooling because it's one reason it's just safe. You're in the you're in home with mom, you know, with dad. In some cases, you're not in the government schools where you're dealing with drugs. And, crime and bullies, bullies you know, and, yeah. yeah big problem yeah it is yeah, a lot of parents understandably concerned about that but also uh, for parents who uh, you know just don't have the time um there's homeschool co-ops mm -hmm. where parents get together you know and in the in the real leftist states they they make it hard for you to do that and the more you know uh, redneck places you know the more conservative places uh, and, and let's you know you know give propers to the uh, religious conservatives, it was, it was largely uh, Christian conservatives who pushed in many states to get homeschooling legalized. Uh, so, you know, you know, so good for them. But in, in, in a lot of conservative states, you know, they put fewer hoops in, in your way. You have homeschool co-ops where parents pool their resources and take turns teaching the kids. 
you know, so one, one kid's mom is an MD and she teaches, you know, a class in biology. Another kid's father is a, you know, engineer and he teaches, you know, the kids mathematics. And, you know, one, one parent is a really avid reader and he or she teaches literature, you know, and, and, uh, I, and it's often, it's, it's generally very effective. Tutors, uh, I think, should be discussed. But even before we get to the tutors, you know, Jack, I think, the single most exciting development in American education today is what they call micro schools, which are really just small community schools, because there's still a lot of good classroom teachers in the, uh, you know, in the government school system. They have to fight against the stifling bureaucracy. And you see more and more often they opt out of the system. And sometimes with a few families, they'll start a small school in one of the families, you know, rec room or basement, you know, set up a whiteboard and some chairs and everything. And with four or five kids, you know, start a start a school, and these are usually the teachers who really want to teach and um, and are most frustrated. You know, teach phonics, teach academic subjects, and they're frustrated with the you know, with the bureaucracy. So uh, the micro schools are becoming so prevalent that a, a year or so ago, Forbes magazine was a business magazine did a story, you know, on 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 the micro schools, and one writer called it the return of the one room schoolhouse. And I think this is the future, you know, of of American education. One, one teacher, few families, of course they could grow, but you yeah. know, Marvin Collins started out that way in the 1970s and grew it into, into West Side Prep. Uh, there, there could be so many business opportunities. Uh, the, the Uber or mm-hmm. the Airbnb of, of teachers, um, people kind of picking right. and choosing. Now I'm gonna get in trouble with my audience if I don't get to some of these dozens of questions that are uh, piling up here. So I still have plenty of my own but I'm going to take a pause on that and uh, turn to some audience questions. Well, so, well, we don't want you to get in trouble with you. <laughs> right, here, right here on Zoom, uh, Phil Coates is asking you um, if there is, was only one change, uh, one thing you could change about education, what would it be? Uh, I'm tempted Privatized to, schools? I'm temp- yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That would be, that would be huge. Unfortunately, it's not viable today, although I think it can be, you know, in the future, I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, um, eliminating the teachers colleges would, would be one and, and have the teachers study content uh, rather than method. I think that, but also phonics, 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 phonics all the time. Marva Collins used phonics. She was a master teacher. And I strongly recommend the movie made about her, the Marva Collins story with, uh, with Cicely Tyson and Morgan Freeman. She used phonics in her math courses, reading the math textbook, sound out the words, you know, phonics, phonics, phonics. And did I say phonics? Once you teach the kids to read, the whole world of knowledge is, is open to them. So I would say two things. Phonics, teach reading, uh, eliminate the teachers' colleges, um, and, and make, the, make the future teachers study content rather than method, and ultimately moving towards privatizing the school system. All right, on Facebook, Carol Sands is asking about school choice. Is it a solution uh, or does it open the door for governments to get involved in private schools as well? Um, yeah, a school, a school choice is, is certainly um, better than what we have now. We, you know, and, and that's why I think a lot of black American families are moving towards homeschool. Because if, if you're, you know, not all black Americans live in the hood, obviously, but, but some do. And if you're in a slum neighborhood, in, you know, Chicago, Baltimore has got the, you know, the reputation for just being terrible these days. Uh, and you see this project Baltimore, the, 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 the schools, all these kids in high school who are reading at a first grade level. I mean, like a lot of them, uh, it's just it's just heartbreaking. So you can see why a lot of uh, the, the black families are take pulling their kids out of the government schools and, and homeschooling. I think that's a, a, a better option. School choice is better than what, than what we have, but that's damn it with faint praise. I think right. homeschool, homeschooling is a lot better, hiring tutors for your kids, uh, homeschool co-ops, micro schools. You, know, you, want, you want as little government involvement in the child's education as, as possible. So that, that's why I think uh, your school choice is still, you, you, you know, if, you, if you, you, you're having these kids move from the, the public school in your district to a public school in a, in a better district, it, it's, it's better, but you're still dealing with the government schools. Much better to, to keep the government out of, out of the school as much as possible. 
All right. Uh, here's a philosophical question for you, Andy. Zach Carter on Facebook asks, considering the state of public education, is there a moral judgment that should be made towards people who knowingly continue to send their kids there? Knowingly is the, is the key word there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of parents, I think they were shocked during the pandemic. Right. When they were, you know, they were watching online uh, to realize, one, how little academic training goes on, and two, how much propaganda, how much in, indoctrination. I saw a recent survey, uh, you know, a poll right around the time my book came out in August of parents who, who what do you want for the kids? And they, their answer was very simple. More academics, less, less political indoctrination. Uh, so if, if parents know that, if they know, knowing is the key point there, and they continue to send their kids it, into these indoctrination factories, then yeah, I, I would, I would condemn them. I would, I would, yeah, I, don't, I, I would do it in a, a respectful way. I would say, <laughs> you know, I, I know it's hard to homeschool, but this is your child's education. That's at stake. They're not going to learn much in, in the government schools. They're going to get indoctrinated with leftist propaganda. You need to find some way to pull them out of the schools, yeah. manage it, manage it some way so that you could, they could be educated at home or in a, you know, with tutors or, you know, in a, right. I, yeah, but I think, yeah. I think knowledge, you know, is, is an important factor in making a moral judgment. And, uh, you know, also our knowing about the reasons of any particular parents and what, what their decisions are reminds me of some of uh, the discussion of sacrifice that you had in your book on heroes, right? So if you mm -hmm. had parents that were like, well, they don't care that, you know, they're, they're saving money and, and um, they're not interested in it. And they pr prefer to, uh, to spend it on, you know, having a nicer home or something. That's maybe where we could start um, entering into moral judgment. But I think more than judgment, what, um, what these parents need is help and practical information uh, and understanding. And that's what this- Yeah, let me, let me just say something about tutors for just a minute, uh, Jack, because um, especially with the rise of the internet and the Zoom technology, the tutors, for, in, for instance, generally have a, have a bachelor's degree in the content subject. Let's say you wanna hire a tutor to teach your kid math and you live in Michigan. And you, you, know, you there, go on varsitytutors.com or LinkedIn, and you find a grad student, let's say University of Oregon, he's halfway across the country, but he's got a bachelor's degree in math, not in education, and he's working on a PhD in math, so he's taken all these math classes, he knows vastly more math than high school teachers do, and he's a graduate student, so he's generally starving, he doesn't have a full-time job, you can get him cheap, you know, <laughs> and it's in his or her self-interest because now you can make money in your expertise right in your living room and in your dorm room, you know, tutoring a kid across the country in math or whatever your, your, your specialty is. So it's in everybody's self-interest. The, the parents can get good tutors, much more knowledgeable than, their, than the school teachers generally are, uh, and get them cheap because in, in grad school, you know, they don't have full-time jobs, so they're struggling. Right. All right. YouTube, we got a question from Scott asking, should parents going to school board meetings just pull their kids or keep trying to fight to make uh, the public schools better? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the good news here is parents, a lot of parents now realize just, you know, that the, the government schools are propaganda mills more than they are educational centers, and they're rallying against the school boards. Uh, the bad news is they haven't, I think a lot of them haven't yet, and they're being labeled domestic terrorists, by the DOJ because they have this funny idea that they want the kids to know how to read and write. But um, uh, the bad news is I don't think they realize that their battle is, is, is futile. Uh, uh, what's his name from the University of Virginia? Uh, uh, Hirsch, E.D. Uh, e. Hirsch in 1996 published you know, the schools we need and why we don't have them. And he labeled the school system an impregnable fortress. He's right. It, it can't be changed. They won't be changed. They won't be reformed. To, to think, it, it's, it's an innocent error, but it's still an error. We, you know, the parents think that the schools, or you know, the powers that be behind the schools, the teachers' colleges, the State Department of Education, and the Federal Department of Education, those are the, the powers that be here. Uh, the interlocking directorate, Arthur Best, uh, called it. 
parents think innocently that the powers that run the school system want the kids to get an education. And so you know, we, if, we, if we yell at them enough, we can reform it. They need to realize the powers that be don't want the kids to get an education. Hmm. They, want, they want the kids to be indoctrinated and serve the state and, you know, and, and push us towards not just socialism anymore, I think towards communism. That's the goal. So then they're not abashed that the kids do so poorly on tests. It doesn't, it doesn't affect them in the least. You're not going to change them. So that's yeah, why that's Hearst is right. It's an impregnable fortress. But the good news is it can't be, uh, it can't be conquered, but it can be circumvented. And, and yes. that's why you hire tutors, homeschool, homeschool co-ops, you know, uh, uh, micro schools and, and so on. And I think, you know, that kind of approach of, of flanking, of, of using capitalism to find ways to create another system on top of the failed system is, is a good approach to all kinds of. Um, yeah. And, and in this case, yeah, in this case, the private schools you're talking about or the, the private tutoring and education you're talking about mm -hmm. is all based on the premise that we want the kids to get an excellent education. And not on the premise that we want the kids uneducated and indoctrinated so they obey the state and don't ask too many questions. All right. Here's a question that um, shifts topics, but it's one that I am also very curious to hear your answer. Anthony Marquette on YouTube asks, Professor Bernstein, how did you make the transition from writing nonfiction to fiction? And what difficulties did that transition incur, if any? Uh, also, do you have any tips or processes, uh, suggestions for aspiring writers? Um, from the time I was a little kid, I wanted to be a writer. I never wanted to be anything else. Always wanted to be a writer and primarily a fiction. And so when I finished grad school, noticed the, the first book I published was a novel, was Heart of the Pagan. So I didn't move from nonfiction to fiction. The first book I published was a novel. Uh, and, um, but, I think the, uh, the key thing, if you, want, if you want to write, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, that I think the key advice that anybody could give to you is very simple. Write. You need to write every day, even if it's at four o'clock in the morning because you're waiting tables, uh, you know, the, the rest of the day. James Michener, who was a very successful novelist, said famously that most first novels are written at three o'clock in the morning. For exactly that reason, some you're not known as a writer yet. So, so you know, you work with some job I was teaching, but somebody could be driving for Uber or whatever, uh, and you're tired. But you know, I understand. But if you want to be a writer, you got to write fiction, nonfiction, whatever it is. You write, and did I yes. say right? That's the way you become a writer, and you make time. Now, I know people are married, they have kids, they have a job, they have all kinds of responsibilities. I know, I get it, but I also know people have free will. And if something is really important to you, you make time. You talk to your spouse, you work it out, you negotiate, you make time for because this means this is like you know, this is like architecture is to Howard Rock. You know, you love it. Uh, I mean, you may not you don't have to be a genius like he is to love it. And so you make time. You you make time. A friend of mine who's very successful hired me to tutor him in philosophy. I know the long hours he worked, and I said. I said, you have time to study philosophy? And he gave me a brilliant answer. I'll never forget. He said, Andy, he said, I don't have time. I make time. So, oh, I like it. I like it. There's wisdom. Right. There's well, wisdom. staying on this topic for, for a second, uh, let's explore um, how you started writing, uh, in particular, your Brooklyn stories. Tell us about that idea and how it came about. Ah, uh, now you now you're talking about know, things that things that I really love because there are some stories in that collection that I'm very proud of. Um, but you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, and it's you know it's it's got the reputation of being a very colorful place, and 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 very often it lives up to its reputation. Sometimes it's too colorful. I can't you know I can't even use the language. <laughs> but, you know what? Well, uh, ask my father. He grew up there too. Oh, did he? Yeah. Well, um, but um. There's a whole, div there's a, the diversity of it. I mean, and not just ethnically, well, ethnic diversity, definitely, but diversity in every way, intellectual diversity, ethnic diversity, you know, diversity of different kinds of jobs, opportunities, schools. And I, mean, I used to play, you know, I was a, always a basketball player. I was playing in the schoolyards in Brooklyn. 
and I, you know, I was a graduate student studying philosophy and one of the guys I'm playing with, buddy of mine, was a bus mechanic. You know, another, you know, another, you know, another guy was a drug dealer. You know, another guy was, you know, it was all you rub elbows with all, you know, so, so I remember guys coming on on, on the courts, you know, with, with with pistols, you know, in the waistband of their of their cutoffs, you know, in the in the summer. I remember saying to one of these guys, why is it off them? I saw you, you doing you you plan on doing some shooting today. You know, because you know, you're playing on the words of shooting a basketball. And he, he just, fortunately for me, he thought it was funny. He laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still here to tell the tale. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's good. I'm not like uh, 50 Cent. Who's, <laughs> what's his claim to fame that he survived nine gunshot wounds? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Something, yeah. something like that. Curtis Curtis Jackson. Now, my claim to fame is, and I grew up in a good neighbor. He grew up, he grew up in the hood. But my claim to fame is on the few occasions where there was any gunshots, I ducked. I never got, <laughs> I never got wounded. But there's, there's a, there's just this the diversity of of stories there. You know, some are about tough guys, you know, uh, criminal types. There's a crime story. There's, uh, you know, a story of there's a love triangle. There's a story about a a graduate student who has to, you know. Um, deal with his Jewish mother and his, you know, to, to marry uh, his uh, girlfriend who's a Catholic, you know, and, and the graduate and his uh, dissertation committee who are opposed to his dissertation promoting egoism. There's a whole range of stories, crime stories, love stories, you know, stories that take place in the universities with professors or, or grad students. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a whole range of them. So, you know, I'm very proud of some of, some of those stories. Well, great. Well, we're going to put the, the link to those uh, in the chats on the platforms as well. So, um, at yeah, the, the title government... the title is the Brooklyn Stories. You get it easily from Amazon. Fantastic. Um, another title by Professor Bernstein is Heroes, Legends, Champions: Why Heroism Matters. Uh, reading it, I have to thank you. Gave me the subject for a future Draw My Life video. I thought, well. We should do my name is Maria Montessori because I didn't realize how dramatic the elements of her life were. So thank you for that. But uh, maybe just tell us psychologically, spiritually, why do human beings need heroes? Well, I've always been a hero worshiper, you know, from the time I was a little kid. Yeah, I was fortunate growing up in the 1960s. And especially in the early '60s, everything everything started to change in the country in the in the in the late '60s. You know, with the drugs and the new left and the hippie movement and the, just the anti-Americanism and the anti-capitalism really uh, took over on the college campuses. But um, early '60s, when I was growing up, I mean, John Wayne was still making movies. So I, I used to go to movies, see all these great John Wayne westerns and everything. Why, why, you know, and, and all these, uh, you know, all these uh, movie stars. Gary Cooper, Clark Gable, you know, they're all, all, these, all these hero, these, these heroic types and, and get real strong female leads, you know, with, whether, whether it was Barbara Stanwyck or uh, I loved uh, Hedy Lamar and I really loved her even more when I found out she was a genius, <laughs> you, you know, who uh, was, a, was a brilliant inventor. But uh, the, the, so I, you know, grew up watching these, the, you know, these Western movies and, you know, and, and everything. And but I was always a hero worshiper. And um, uh a few a few points. First of all, uh, we need heroes in a practical sense. You know who who and, and Ayn Rand shows us this. And you know Howard Rooks, my all time favorite hero. Heroes stand up very often. You know for, for for what they know is right against all kinds of opposition. Uh, that their their life may be threatened, or their career, or their or their lover, or their family, or their home. Some value that they treasure is threatened, and heroes stand up. You know and and in in very practical terms, they promote human life. And, and, you know, they build uh, these brilliant buildings or they come up with theories and science that society rejects, whether it's Copernicus or Pasteur or Galileo, but they stand, you know, they stand for the truth or, or sometimes they have to physically, you know, they're, they're, sometimes they're warriors. One of my favorite novels is Shane. And Shane's a gunfighter. He's not a he's not a brilliant intellectual like Howard Rourke. He's a gunfighter, but he protects the best people against the bad guys. You know, and he's and you know, and he saves their lives. So in many in, in many different forms, uh, heroes provide practical value in, in in human life. And then secondly, like you said, they provide inspirational value because like Shane does for Bobby Starrett. Uh, they you know, they they show us. 
that, that human beings can be both good and effective, that human beings aren't necessarily you know, villains or, or hapless victims, but that the, the, the good can be strong and the strong can be good. And they motivate us, they inspire us to be the best version of ourselves. So I think for both those reasons, we need both the practical and the inspirational benefit, we need heroes. Why do you think that anti-heroes or flawed heroes are more in fashion these days? I'm thinking of like John Dutton, the Yellowstone, or James Lee Burke's Dave Robichaux. What does this say about contemporary culture and the philosophical premises that underlie it? Yeah, I see, I don't watch TV, so I don't know those specific <laughs> characters. But I, but I know a little bit about the show. I, I assume these guys are flawed heroes, that they're a heroic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I grew up watching um, uh, Star Trek. And, and then, you know, the modern kind of version of that is Battlestar Galactica. It was a really great series, but you know, everybody in it was just, uh, they, they, they certainly weren't a, uh, a Captain Kirk. You know, they, they all yeah. had their, these flaws and foibles and it just made it harder to, I don't know, really get inspired by it. No, I understand. And I have a chapter in the hero book on flawed heroes. I have one on anti-heroes. I use Thomas Jefferson as my example of right. a flawed hero, you know, who did, who did a lot, morally did a lot of bad things in his life, including, you know, never freeing his own slaves, but still was a towering hero in so many ways, and especially writing lead author of the Declaration of Independence. So heroes can be flawed, but, you know, we selectively focus on their, you know, on their, on their achievements, rather, you know, we acknowledge their flaws, including their moral ones, but we focus on the achievements because it's the good that promotes life that's most important, not the, not the evil that, that harms it. That's what we should focus on. But the anti-hero mentality, is the idea that if, if heroes are generally greater than every man, you know, like smarter, so like I always love Sherlock Holmes, you know, he's always the smartest guy in a room and he always uses his genius to foil crime, never, never to, to foment it. You know, so in some way, the hero is greater than every man. He's smarter or he's, he's more determined or, you know, physically more, uh, has greater prowess like Shane. The, the anti-hero is lesser generally than, than every man. It's kind of a nebbish, you know, just kind of a, uh, it's kind of like t- timid and, you know, and it lets himself be pushed around. Woody Allen's made a fortune in kind of portraying that kind of character in, in comedic roles. But the reason why the anti-hero has been so popular for the last hundred years is, you're right, what you said is philosophical. One is Freud's influence. That we, you know, we all come out of dysfunctional families and we're all troubled and, you know, we're, we, we never, we never, we never resolve our problems, which is, which is the literary world's take on Freud. And I have to say, it's unfair to Freud because as crazy as Freud was, he, he, he saw psychoanalysis as a way that we could solve our problems, you know, not really problems, but the literary world took it as they, 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 they just pushed aside the, the positive aspect that says you're all, we're all riddled with edible complexes or whatever. And so, you know, leading examples of that, well, you know, it's like Eugene O'Neill of uh, morning uh, becomes a lecture is a perfect example of that, that version of the anti-hero. Everybody's just riddled with these inner, these inner conflicts and they're just sick. Oh, Faulkner's novels. Faulkner's, I don't know if Faulkner was actually influenced by Freud, but he writes like he was. You know, his, mm. his characters are just demented and deeply disturbed. And it's like, it has a, Faulkner has a certain power because it's like you're in the loony bit. And it's not boring. Being around psychopaths or crazy people is not boring. But, but it's, not, it's not very uplifting either. And I think the other influence here, Jake, is Marx. You know, and the idea that capitalism crushes us and we're helpless playthings of the capitalist system. Arthur Miller is a good example. You know, Willie Loman in Death of a Salesman, he's bamboozled by the American dream and he's driven to his his, his own destruction. Uh, and so they put those two together where, where either we're, you know, we're sick, we're, we're neurotics and we don't have the moral strength to stand up to our family or whatever, or we're just crushed by the capitalist system. John Steinbeck's another example of that, Grapes of Wrath, for example. Uh, so uh, yeah, the, 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 the philosophic, the intellectual influence of Marx and Freud, I think, is, is what led to the anti-human mentality, dominating modern literature. 
Well, we have about five minutes left. Many questions from both our audience and my own that uh, that we're not going to get to. Um, I did have one uh, about an essay that you wrote about two years ago, the, which was called The Left is Vastly More Evil uh, Than Religious Conservatives. I couldn't agree more, but that is not a universal view, even among objectivists, even on our own faculty here at the Atlas Society. So uh, do you think it's more or less true two years later? Well, after the Biden administration tried to is put in a, a division of disinformation and mm -hmm. uh, homeland security, which is very, very opposed to freedom of speech, you know, I, I just reread 1984 and I'm writing an essay on it for the objective standard. I immediately speak Ministry of Truth. So I think, you know, which all well named very nicely. So I certainly think even more so the left is is more dangerous than the, than the right. But I should point out, by the way, because what you said is right. It's this, this is a very contentious point amongst objectivists. And I don't know if I, Ayn Rand might disagree for all I know, because I can, I'm old enough to remember in 1980 when she very strongly opposed Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, she, she, you know, she urged her supporters not to vote for Reagan. I love Ayn Rand. There's nobody in the world I respect more than Ayn Rand, but I voted for Reagan on the simple grounds like that I thought, you know, Carter and the Democrats were worse. Oh my God, wouldn't I have loved to have Reagan around today to, oh, yeah. to, to be able to, to vote for him? But yeah, I think two things here on this, why I think this. First, two points. First of all, I think the ultimate goal of the left is communism. And I don't even mean socialism anymore. I mean, full communism. And the ultimate goal of the conservatives is uh, theocracy. So, but, you know, if I put it this way, I think the, the, the leftists are much more advanced towards communism than the conservatives are towards theocracy. That's one, one point. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the opposition to freedom of speech is a smoking gun. It's a red flag, if I can you know, play on yeah. words here. It's not the conservatives pushing it. It's the left. Uh, right. And two, and I think the most controversial point is I think communism and national socialism are both more evil than religion, especially Christianity, then uh, they're both in, in an absolute sense. I think collectivism is more evil than religion in an absolute sense, especially Christianity. I'm, I think I would even argue that communism or, or Nazism was even worse than Islam. So if I, if I had to live in Iran right. or China, I would take it. I would take Iran. If I had to live in Afghanistan or North Korea, I would take Afghanistan as the lesser of interesting, less, well. lesser of two wheels. But Christianity has, for all of its evils and all of its horrors, and I'm not going to defend Christianity. It's the you know to say it's less evil than communism is uh, you know is damning it with faint praise. But they have a respect for the individual soul that the, the communists and the Nazis just do everything they can to kill individuality. Right. The Christians have some respect. Islam doesn't. Christianity does, you know, the, the individual soul. And it, 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 Christianity's done a lot of evil, but it, the, the evil it's done, it, I think, is limited by, you know, the respect for the individual soul and the free will that comes with it. The Christians generally gave uh, their enemies a brutal choice, convert or die, which is yeah. brutal, it's horrible, it's evil. But you could save your life and your kid's life by converting. Nazis never offered the choice yeah. you you and me our families as, as jews yeah, we'll convert to national socialism <laughs> that doesn't matter what you're making right no, there's no that's, choice that's, there's no that's choice. true yeah no i i, I think that's interesting the, the framing that you gave it to say that uh the the marxists um have made more progress towards totalitarian communism than uh religious conservatives have made towards theocracy um, and I also think if you look at what's happening right now, people are becoming less religious. And in fact, uh, young people in particular are increasingly becoming more socialist. So it's it's not just the you know absolute progress; it's it's the relative uh, rate of acceleration. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and direction a, of it. True, and there's a whole group of people who call themselves Christian objectivists or Jewish objectivists, they're influenced by, they're religious, but they're influenced by Ayn Rand. I'm looking around for the Marxist objectivists. <laughs> I don't, yes, no, that's I don't true. see any. I, that's uh, one of the reasons I wrote uh, my Wall Street Journal op-ed, Can You Love God and Ayn Rand, which was not to imply, uh, and I think I made it quite clear, that there was uh, 
that objectivism and uh, Christianity or any kind of, you know, supernatural uh, belief or belief in an otherworldly um, system or, or using faith over reason that that wasn't compatible. But there's a lot of Christians. I know quite a few of them who are enormous Ayn Rand fans. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, I have uh, a lot more hopes and I've demonstrated um, progress towards reaching young religious people. No, absolutely. Not, right. Young Marxists, forget about it. That's not yeah, going to happen. So. With most leftists, there's a few I know, moderate leftists who read Ayn Rand, but the overwhelming preponderance of leftists hate Ayn Rand and they either ignore her or they denounce her. Whereas yes. religious people, you know, some, some hate her. Some, Buck, yeah. Buckley but, did and, and Coulter does, but there's a lot of religious conservatives. Oh, you'd be surprised. You know, Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> Right, the yeah. Rush Limbaugh, Mark Levin. There's a lot of the religious yeah. conservatives that respect Ayn Rand, quota, and everything. I love it. All right. Well, this is um, fantastic. Uh, appreciate the time. Appreciate your talents. And again, folks, this is the book. Go out and buy it, or get the Audible. Again, I can highly recommend that. And um, thank you, thank you for this time and for all you do, Andy. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Jack. Thanks for having me on. And at some point in the future, maybe we can reprise this. I would love to because I I I had so many questions. questions. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And I want to thank everyone who is watching us today. Thank you for all of your great questions. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoy the other work we do, our graphic novels, animated videos, and the like, hey, you know what time of year it is. Consider making a tax-deductible donation to the Atlas Society, and I hope to see you next week. We're going to be returning to, as all of you know, one of my favorite themes, uh, talking with journalist Jean Lenzer, um, particularly about some of the uh, psychological devastation and collateral damage of some of the authoritarian interventions during COVID. So hope to see you guys next week. Thank you.